Coming up, snuffling for truffles in Piemonte, Italy. Aga Aga, meet the most famous mascot in North America. And herding fish on a trout farm. The town of Asti is in the heart of Italy's Piemonte region. In its main piazza, Birba, a poodle cross, is a familiar face. Ciao Birba, dov'è Sandrino? Birba is trained to find truffles, a type of mushroom that gourmets love. Ciao Birba, dove sei stata? Vieni qua, qua. Birba, vieni un po' su qui. Birba is Sandrino stata? Romanelli's inseparable companion. Oh, buono, Sandrino has been hunting vedere. truffles for 20 years. Oh, Birba has been going with him for the last four. When I first met Birba, her owner was a balloon vendor in the town square. I fell in love with Birba and, and convinced her owner to give her to me. Now, she comes everywhere I go. I've been taking her truffle hunting with me for so long that she's become an excellent truffle hunter too. Sandrino's store sells regional specialties, including truffles. It's full of products made with truffles. Truffle-flavored oil, truffle-flavored cheeses and sausages, truffle-flavored pasta, and truffle grappa. There are several varieties of truffles, but white truffles are the most precious. White truffles sell for up to $15,000 US per kilo. They're one of the costliest foods on the planet. These buried treasures grow up to two feet underground. They're hard to find and impossible to cultivate. When they're mature, they give off a scent that can be detected by the right nose, which is why truffle hunters use dogs like Birba. Birba and Sandrino have won many truffle competitions, so the pressure's on to do well at the truffle fair in nearby Moncalvo. It's one of the most prestigious truffle events in Italy, and it's less than 48 hours away. <laughs> All the truffle hunters in the region are on the hunt for large, perfect truffles. Birba doesn't think this one's a prize winner. All truffle hunters have secret spots only they know about. To make sure no one sees where they're going, they hunt when it's dark. Truffle dogs also hunt better at night because there are fewer distractions. Sandrino and Birba often go truffle hunting with his brother and his truffle hound, Max. It's very charming, very fun to see them compete. Each one wants to find it first. They both want to find the most truffles. Max. Every time Birba makes a find, she's rewarded with a treat. Certain trees, like hazelnut, oak, and fruit trees, produce the right conditions for truffles to grow. But there's never any guarantee. In a valley like this one, there might be a hundred logical places truffles would reproduce, but there may actually only be one. And in the spot we find one this year, there might not be one next year. The hunt hasn't been very successful. The dogs have only found three small truffles. Sandrino is determined to do better, and he'll be out hunting again with Birba in a few hours. It's been a very short night for both Birba and Sandrino, but doing well at the Montcalvo Truffle Fair is more important than sleeping. The 
esattamente come Tartu Fai. We keep trying until the last moment, until the very, very last minute. We keep looking in the hope of finding a great truffle, the truffle that will impress the people at the fair, the one that will win. Even on just a few hours sleep, Birba and Sandrino still have the energy to hunt for truffles. They have a reputation to uphold. My relationship with Birba is both easy and difficult to describe. She's not just a pet, she's my companion, my life companion. She lives with me. It's an even closer relationship than a relative or a wife because she's always with me. We are always, always together, day and night, wherever I go, in whatever circumstance, whatever situation. Aha! Birba smells something. But is it a prize winner? Before heading over to Moncalvo, Sandrino grabs a quick espresso at a coffee bar he owns. I found nice truffles this morning, but I can't show anyone. It's a big secret, a big surprise. <laughs> Things are just getting started at the Moncalvo Truffle Fair. There are several categories of prizes called calvos. Angela Strona is the fair organizer. To win a calvo is indeed a prestigious honor. The top prize will go to the one single truffle, the one truffle that is the most beautiful. And when we say beautiful for a truffle, we mean a combination of qualities. The size of the truffle, for example, is one element, but it also has to have a good shape and a good texture and scent, all of the qualities that make a good truffle. If media interest is any indication, Sandrino and Birba are among the favorites to win. This morning, a gorgeous truffle was brought in by Sandrino. But you never know, because at the very last minute, something can always happen. This presenting of truffles is a kind of rite that is prolonged, made ceremonious. And truffle hunters are secretive, and they sometimes wait until the very last minute to bring it to the exhibition. It's time for the grand prize. The judges evaluate the truffle's size, appearance, and scent. Birba and Sandrino's truffle is the biggest. The mayor of Moncalvo is delighted to show it around. The tension is mounting. Sandrino and Birba await the final verdict. And the grand winner is... Sandrino is eager to share the honor with Birba. I think that Sandrino's truffle is one of the most beautiful we've ever seen in this piazza, or that we've ever seen in this region in the past few years. This is certainly due to Sandrino's skills and, of course, to Birba's nose. We presented Sandrino with a silver hoe, but, of course, Birba should also get a prize. After all, she's the reason we're celebrating tonight. Thanks to dogs like Birba, truffles make their way to restaurant tables from Moncalvo all the way to the famous Barbeta restaurant in New York City.
Tonight, Birba, Sandrino, and their friends enjoy the exquisite flavor of truffles and the sweet taste of victory at a lavish dinner given in their honor. The University of Georgia Bulldogs are one of the top-ranked and most popular teams in American college football. In the U.S., college football is synonymous with tradition. Up to 85,000 fans come from far and wide to see the Bulldogs play and to see the most popular member of the team. Meet Ugga the Sixth the most famous mascot in North America. Just the sight of Ugga puts the crowd in a frenzy. It's 15 minutes to kick off, and Ugga's work really begins. Everybody wants to have their picture taken with him, from very young fans to older ones from cheerleaders to Superman. It's early in the game. Ugga encourages the players and excites the fans with his antics. This mascot gets results. Ugga is also a part-time cameraman with a specially designed Ugga cam. It lets the crowd see what he sees on the Jumbotron. When things don't go the Georgia Bulldogs way, Ugga gets physical with the opposite team's mascot, which just happens to be a cat. All this attention sometimes makes his teammates jealous. But Ugga isn't intimidated. He'll take anyone on. Ugga the Sixth is the great, great, great grandson of a white English bulldog given to Sonny and Cecilia Seiler in 1956. Well, in 1956, I was in law school at the university. We were already married. And at that particular time, they didn't have a mascot. And so by the time the uh, season for 56 rolled around, we decided to dress the dog up in a child's red t-shirt that Cecilia had cut down to fit him and put a black G on the chest, just on a hoot. And he attracted his share of attention. And later on, Coach Butt asked us if they could use the dog for the mascot. We were delighted, and that's how it all got started. Each of the mascots in the illustrious Ugga lineage has had his own claim to fame. Ugga's father, Ugga V, was particularly renowned for an incident that took place in a game against Auburn. He nearly took a bite out of an opposing team member who had just scored a touchdown. This move won him the coveted Play of the Year award from ESPN and Sports Illustrated. When Ugga the Sixth isn't working hard at being a mascot, he lives on Easy Street at the Siler's home in Savannah, Georgia. Cecilia manages Ugga's busy social calendar, filled with fundraising and charity work. Oh. 
At 55 pounds, or 25 kilos, Ugga the Sixth is the biggest Ugga ever. Ugga is a big hit with kids, and he loves the attention. English bulldog pups can have a lot of energy, but mature dogs are more calm and gentle. The Silers and the reigning Ugga have attended every University of Georgia home game since 1956. Just as the Ugga legacy is passed on from father to son, caring for Ugga is passed down from one generation to the next. Sonny's son Charles takes care of handling him on the field. Bulldogs don't usually do much, so all of this work is exhausting for Ugga. The heat doesn't help so he takes a breather, going from his air-conditioned doghouse to sit on a bag of ice. Ugga's predecessors are the world's only mascots to be buried with a memorial within a university stadium. This famous bulldog is even being profiled in a documentary about the Uggas called Damn Good Dog. At the University of Georgia, Ugga is almost as much a part of the action as the players are. For the 85,000 fans, a football game wouldn't be complete without their favorite mascot. The snap is high and bad, but he caught him. They're coming on him. He got away from him and then threw a long bomb. And it's caught by Fred Gibson, a long touchdown! Another victory for the Georgia Bulldogs, thanks in no small part to their mascot, Ugga the Sixth. Dogs make excellent herders when it comes to cattle, goats, sheep, and fish. Meet Maggie, one of only two dogs in the world who herds trout. The other trout herder is Kayla, who taught her everything she knows. Together with Lisa Shaver, they help run the Beaver Kill Trout Hatchery in the Catskill Mountains in New York State. Come on, Kayla. Come on, Kayla. Every morning, Maggie, Lisa, and the kids head out to catch fish. It's Tyler, let her go. It may be early, but this golden lab is always eager to work. Come on, girls. Come on. The trout farm produces a quarter million fish a year, and the daily catch runs anywhere from 100 to 1,000 fish. Maggie, the trout herder, is indispensable. Come on, Tyler, I need your help. The first step is to run the net down the side of the pond. Right here, hold the string. Okay? Good. Come on, girls. Let's go. We like to use the dogs in the pond because when you're working by yourself, it's way easier to send the dog ahead of us. She goes to the other end of the pond and actually herds the fish around and into the net with us. Maggie is better than a human because when you're working in the ponds and you have a dog, it saves labor of another person. Um, they're more accurate. They can get up into the chutes where for a person to do it, it takes a longer amount of time. It takes actually less time to use the dogs. The fish try to escape the net by swimming into the chute between the ponds. 
Maggie flushes them back out. The chute is too small for people, but Maggie's the perfect size for getting into the chute to herd the fish back out into the pond and into the net. When she brings it around, she'll bring it home, come home, come home. That's when she comes to me. With her waterproof coat, Maggie's built for the water, and she loves swimming. Labrador retrievers were once used by Canada's fishermen off the rocky coast of Newfoundland. The labs would swim out to retrieve the nets and drag the catch ashore. She's very happy, she's very kind. She's always been great with kids. Maggie works really hard, don't you, Maggie? Maggie will be in working and Caleb will sit on the shoreline, sort of, you know that she's telling her something, but you don't know what it is, you know, just by the way she'll look at her, she'll cock her head, so it's kind of neat. When we're hand grading the fish out, a lot of times what will happen is we'll throw them back into the pond. If it's a fish that's perfect, she'll let it go back into the pond. If it's a fish that has something wrong with it, what'll happen is she will take it and she'll bring it up on the bank because for some reason she knows there's something wrong with it. And I've questioned her a lot and I'll walk up on the bank and I'll look at her and I'll see the fish and lo and behold, there's 99% of the time there's something wrong with it. My son Tyler is the one that helps me out in the ponds and that's Maggie's favorite play partner. They play stick, they play ball. She follows him around when he plays on his bike. So um, they have a great relationship. She has a great relationship with all of my kids.